sound and logical. Hebrew mythology. Now every nation has a mythological story that deals with explaining phenomena, natures, interaction, engagement. So for this particular presentation, I'm going to look at the Hebrew mythologies. So mythology is the study of myths in general and the study of myths particularly to a culture. A myth refers to a story that is supposed to have occurred at an unspecified time in the past. Myths often involve gods and goddesses and they exist to explain particular natural phenomena or traditionally held beliefs. So what defines myths or something that's mythological? One, of or relating to mythology or myths dealt with in a mythology. Two, lacking factual basis or historical validity, mythical, fabulous. All right, so when we look at the Hebrew framework, what was the first deity called? Like, what is the name of God originally before he reintroduces himself again and gives another name? But what was the first name of God? What was he known as? So, in popular culture, they have Al Shaddai or Aleon, which is interesting. You have Aleon, there you have Shamot Aleon. Here you have the name of God as Al Aleon. Now, Elohim and Aleon, slightly different. Ale Elohim and Aleon, slightly different. Elohim can mean a plethora of different things. Aleon is very specific. That's interesting. All right, so let's continue as we look at Hebrew mythology. Again, all nations have a legendary mythological account, oftentimes over exaggerated, um, oftentimes hyperbolical, but all nations have some sort of origin story. So when we go to the ancient Canaanite pantheon, one of their deities in their mythological accounts is Al Elyon, and he's the father of heaven. He's also the patriarchal deity he's the dad he's the the, the 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 man with the beard who sits on the chair he's the father he holds it all together so he's the father of heaven or the father of the gods and you also, you always find in the pantheon you always find a father and if you have a father they should be a mother so his wife or his consort was asherah which is interesting uh, they had some children in the mythological stories anat Ashtar, Baal, Mot, Shashar, Shalim. Ah, we're going to go there eventually. Uh, Shapesh, Yam, and, uh, you know, some other deities. It stands to reason as well that one of the deities who is from this union is a deity called Yahweh or Yahua or whatever way you want to remix the Yah. But he was part of this pantheon too. Although that part is somewhat contested but we will see this is shallow stuff this is i'm just paddling in the pool with this we're not gonna go deep we're gonna come back i didn't even want to touch on this but we're just gonna keep it very very shallow here is an interesting thing i was looking at Elyon and most high and this stuff remember i showed you as well that zeus is also referred to as most high because he sits on the most high part of mount olympus most gods often have a mountain and they often are the head of the other gods because of their authority on the mountain. It's interesting. Anyway, so you have Mao Shezadek, who's adapted another Canaanite name as an appellation for God. So it's interesting the E and the E, which makes maybe a certain number. Um, but anyway, Al Elyon. So where do you see the first example? Remember, I said that there's a difference between Elohim and there's a difference between um, Al Elyon. And we're going to see where this name was first introduced. So Hebrew and Canaan connection in the mythology. So who is Al Elyon? Well, in Genesis 14, verse 18, then Mal Shazadek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Often in mythological stories too, there's an emphasis on bread and wine. When you go to Dionysus, bread and wine. When you go to the 
mythological story of Rome and Mithras. You have bread and wine. You also have the blood of the bull and you also have the blood of the lamb. You see a lot of parallelisms when you go to the realm of mythology. And this is why it's not really taught, history is not really taught too much in school unless it's a certain type of history. But going back to this though, so who is El Elyon in Genesis 14, 18? Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of Elyon. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God El Elyon, creator of the heaven and earth. And praise be to El Elyon, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now it's interesting as well, the culture of El is everywhere and we're going to start breaking this it's going to once you see it, it's hard to unsee like it's literally one of them things like once you see it's literally hard to unsee and it's like wow how did i not see that i saw it before they used to say to you that they took the names of god out the bible because they were trying to remove god from the bible no no they they did they did it for a reason because when you put the names back in there you're like hold up this isn't something right but let's continue. We'll go a little bit more. So, Elion, the most high god of Canaan, right? And every nation, culture has a mythological story, mythological account, Epic of Gilgamesh. You have, like I said, many nations have their own little story about the creation of the world, um, the ending of the world, how things happen, how things developed. And it's often central to their culture, to their nation. It's a national story, it's a national epic. So El Elyon, the most high of Canaan. Um, so you have Psalm 78, verse 35. They remember that God was their rock, the El Elyon, their redeemer. We're also going to see as well that one of the symbols for El in his anamorphic state was a bull. But one of the symbols for El in his non-anamorphic state was a man with a beard and um, who sat on a chair. Genesis 14, 22, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Avram of El Elyon, possessor of heaven and Eretz. I cry out to El Elyon, to God who accomplish, accomplishes my request for me. Interesting. It's funny as well. When, like I said, when you understand how what all this mythological stuff is and how it just all meshes together and how it's just one religious system of whatever it is, you start to just become a bit disillusioned from the whole narrative. But if you're always in the narrative, it's hard to see outside of it. So let's continue a little bit more. So Abraham of the Hebrews paid a tithe to a Canaanite priest. Now, when you go to Josephus, who is reportedly a, a historian, but I think he might have been made up by Rome. But that's my opinion. But using him as a historical figure, Josephus says that Melchizedek is a Canaanite chieftain. And in the next breath, Josephus says that Melchizedek is a priest. So a chief and a priest. Interesting. So either, either way, Melchizedek, a very interesting character many religions and schisms people want to be Melchizedek there's a lot of Melchizedek talk all over the place and people say he's Shem people say he's this people say he's that people say he's Jesus people say he's an angel there's a lot of mystery and nebulousness when it comes to the origins of Melchizedek so why did Israel take this Canaanite de deity as their own I thought Canaanites were their enemies why take their god why, if you can't sleep with their women, will you sleep with their God? Why, if you're not allowed to associate with their culture, are you going to take the apex of their culture, which is their God? Why would a Hebrew man pay a tithe to a Canaanite priest of his Canaanite pantheon? It doesn't make a lot of sense until you realize it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, going back to this. Melchizedek is an old Canaanite name. The god whom Melchizedek serves as priest is Al Elyon, again a name of a Canaanite origin, probably designating the high god of their pantheon. 
Later, the Hebrews adapted another Canaanite name as an appellation for God. Um, all right, cool. So Melchizedek, Canaanite priest of Elion, received tithes of Abram or Abraham. Very interesting man with not a lot of evidences for him, but very essential to the three trinities of Islam, Hebrewanity, and Christianity for a reason. Anyway, so why did Israel take this Canaanite deity as their own? I thought Canaanites were the enemies. Why take their God? I thought they did child sacrifices. I thought they were like the epitome of evil. So why would you take their God? That makes no banana sense. But anyway, it's interesting when you write these books. So in the Levant Pantheon, you have, I found this, this picture quite funny. So you have the Canaanite mixer. Have you met my wife Asherah? It's complicated. Christian mixer. Most high is cool too. Israelite mixer. I don't know why I made that tree, okay? Yahweh. You're going to see that it's just one big pantheon thing from the Levant and people were fighting for religious supremacy. Let's continue. Malchizedek or Malki Tezdek. Now, when it comes to um, the Semitic tongue, El and Al are the same thing. El and Al are the same thing. We're going to show more of this factually. El, Al, El, Al, Al, El, same thing. So Malchizedek or Malik Tezedek, a Canaanite priest of El Elyon, received tithes of Abram. So is Jesus, Yahushua, Yahashua, Yahawashai, so is Jesus, aka Emmanuel, the son of El Elyon, a deity from the Canaanite mytholog mythological pantheon? Just something to think about, contemplate. Maybe. From the continent of Africa to the continent of Asia to the continent of Europe, just worldwide, this religion of Al is quite pervasive. It's everywhere. It's interesting. Al in the, Al in the pantheon of Canaan is known as the father. He's the, the, the god of patriarchs. He's the god of men. He's the god of dads. Over time, religions, how religions get formed is a thing called syncretism, where religions, if you want to colonize somebody, you have to take away their God. Now, every nation had a God. Every, you had a national God, you had a city God. Every person had some sort of God, so, some sort of monument to bind people together for cohesion. So you had a city God and you had a state God. Now, when you invaded a city or a state, you would take away their God and put them into your storehouse or you would just totally annihilate their god and introduce your god by the sword or you'd merge the gods with the pen that's where you get syncretism so you see a lot of these mergers and you're going to see a lot of this plain as day plain as day when we actually get into the the, the meat of the presentations all right you're going to see all the names merge into one so the canaanite religion was the group of ancient Semitic religions practiced by the Canaanites living in the ancient Levant from at least the early Bronze Age. And it's interesting as well, we never get taught the Bronze Age. We never really get taught the Bronze Age period. Never get taught that at all. All right, so the Canaanite religion was the group of ancient Semitic religions practiced by the Canaanites living in the ancient Levant from at least the early Bronze Age to the first century CE. Canaanite religion was polytheistic and in some cases monolatristic. It was influenced by neighboring cultures, particularly ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian religious practices. The pantheon was headed by the god El and his consort Asura or Ashara. Interesting. With other significant deities including Baal, Anat, Astarate and Mot. Now, what is monolatry? So, monolatry is the belief in the existence of many gods, but with the consistent worship of only one deity. So, the strap line or the banner for Abrahamic beliefs is monotheism. We believe in one God, one God, one God. That's like the, the, the blowing of the trumpet. One God, one God, Islam, one God, one God. Christianity, one God, one God. But then when it comes to the Trinity, people get a bit like, yo, three in one, one in three. There's a little bit of like ambiguity. Like, what are you talking about? Three in one, one in three. But overall, 
One God, one God, one God. James says, you believe in one God, you do well. Even the devil believes and trembles. So check it. The main punchline for monotheism or the Abrahamic belief system was this monotheism thing. But it all came from polytheism. We're going to see as we expand and go in. Opinions aside, facts only. All right, let's continue. So this name Elion has been very influential to many people. El Elion and... We're gonna break down. <laughs> we're gonna break down these names. I can't believe how plain it is. You know, like these people have been very plain, very plain. So El Elyon, the Most High God, he that comes to God must believe that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews eleven verse six. So this is this is two separate books. So this is a book by a prophet Climate Wiseman, very humble name. Um, but you can never separate God from his rewards when you realize every name of God has a reward to it. Hey, if you're a priest, suddenly. His name becomes important in your life. Hey, if you're a priest, the name El Elyon means the most high God, the God that is above all other gods. When you know the power of El Elyon, there is no battle you cannot win in life. In the latest installment of Names of the God series, discover 11 different times when you need to call upon the name of El Elyon. And again, this is by Prophet Climate Wiseman, uh, international renowned Sia philosopher proven expert in the divinity god has confirmed his ministry through powerful signs and wonders such as blind eyes being opened healing from incurable diseases dead being raised to life and many more he holds a phd in religious philosophy and is the founder of the kingdom church one of the most powerful deliverance ministries in europe with offices worldwide that's an amazing resume and then you have another uh, book called our elion god of the hebrews when you check the Levitical system of the priest, it's no different to what you see in a monastery. Bro, it's no different to what you see today with your Creflo dollars. They were given land. They were given the best part of the meats. They were given uh, money. They had a threefold ministry. <laughs> land, money, and food. But I don't want to be too rude because some of your dads might be ministers and pastors and that. I don't want to upset um, what do they call children of pastors? I can't remember what they call them. Let's continue though. So, when you go to Daniel 7.18, OJB Bible, it says, but Kado, Kado Shim. <laughs> hey, Kado Shim. We're going to start breaking out all these deities that people are calling on thinking it's something special and it's just really gods from a pantheon. Wow. So, but the Kado Shim, Elion, holy ones of the Most High, shall receive the kingdom and shall possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So again, just another reference to El Elyon. Now, some Bibles might just say God, they might just say Lord, they might just say Most High, like they, they've taken the, the names out. I'm putting the names back. When you put the names back, you're like, hold up. That name is in the Canaanite pantheon. That name don't even come from there. That name, and you start, hold up. Hmm, that's interesting. From Al to Yah will be the next presentation. This is not deep. Low, this is not deep. We're gonna we're gonna show you the names, how they merged, how there was political, all in the book and outside the book. You're gonna see that people were taking from cultures around them and trying to make a quick look of religion. You'll see. Anyway, so Al was the father of the gods of the patriarchs, the gods of the uh, pantheon. He was the god, the most high god in the highest position in the senate or the highest position. In the assembly of the gods again in most mythologies you have the high god in the assembly of the gods like odin zeus osiris every nation had a story about their origins creations so on and so forth all right next time we're going to be talking about the yah element we're going to be talking on yahweh or yahuwah we're going to talk about that element we're going to talk about him so that's interesting so that next one will be called Yahweh Hebrew Mythology. But again, this is just simple. This is, this is basic, basic, basic. I can't believe it's the basic things we miss. I miss this. I miss this. You know why? I didn't know that the book wasn't historical. I thought the book was historical. When I realized it wasn't historical, that set me on a, a path of hold up. If this is not even factual and people are doing things and believing things and doing practices as if they actually are factual, that's insanity. You understand? So let's continue. I'm going to show you one little video. Let's check this out. Day eight of praying to the names of God by Dr. Tony Evans. Let's get into it. All right, so the name we have today is El Elyon, which means the most high God. 
And the verse they give us is out of Daniel 3.26, and it says, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, El Elyon, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And then our prayer for today is, El Elyon, I ask you to manifest your powerful might within me more and more each day. Too often I look to myself when I get into a difficult situation. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I see the flames, and so often I become fearful. Help me instead to look to you, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. You are not only the creator God, you are Elion, most high. You do not faint or grow weary. Your understanding is unsearchable. Give me power when I feel faint and increase my strength when I am weak. Help me to wait well on you as the young Hebrews did in the midst of the roaring flames. Amen. All right, so that sounded very good, didn't it? You hear that all the time. Elyon, all that kind of stuff. We're going to touch on um, Yahweh or Yahuwah. And we're going to show you where these things come from too, as well. Don't get triggered. Listen, research. If it's incorrect, throw it away. But just because it makes you feel upset, triggered, you've invested a lot of time and energy. Who hasn't? I have too. In fact, my sons have, got, my sons have their names out in their names. <laughs> Again, there's nothing even wrong with that. You just have to understand a lot of these religions, bro, they come from the same place. A lot of them are then fabricated. A lot of them are romanticized. A lot of them are exaggerated. A lot of them have no historical basis outside of the narrative that they're written in, which makes perfect sense. Why would you write a narrative and the narrative not make sense within the narrative? But outside that narrative, a lot of things don't make no sense. All right? Now, next part we're going to do, and again, we haven't even got even, we haven't even got, listen, there's a matter of things that I want to show, yeah? It's not even there, okay? It's not even done yet today. This is just a little clip shot, snapshot. So when we come back, we're going to talk about the yard and the our connections. We're going to break it all down. You'll see it for yourself. When you look, read the Bible, you'll be like, whoa, oh, wow. Some plagiarism's going on here, all right? And um, you'll see it for yourself, clear as day. It isn't, but a lot of these stories and that, they're not unique. They're not original. They're not worth as original. They're, they're, they're readaptations. They've been repurposed. We're going to see as we bring it all out. I don't want to even talk too much and say too much. I just want the evidences to do the talking. The evidence is in the text, out the text, but do the talking. So to summarize then, we we're just looking at very basic stuff. Elion. Hebrew mythology looking at what a myth, a myth is, lacking factual basis or historical validity. Many people, black, white, yellow, red, bold head or natty dread, they say Al, Al, Elyon, Al Shaddai, Al Al Al, Al Al Al. Obviously you have Elohim, which is different to Al Elyon. You understand that Elohim means a plethora of different things. And Elyon is very specific, all right? Elyon also is part of the ancient Canaanite pantheon. We looked at Melchizedek, but a lot of the a lot of the secrecy and privacy and like weird stuff around Melchizedek. People want him to be Shem. People want him to be Jesus. People want him to be an immortal god. People want him to be an ascended master. People want him to be all kinds of stuff. But in a mythology, you can do kinds of stuff like that. You don't have to be very specific. You can be very very vague. You understand? But truth be told. This Melchizedek character within the context of the narrative was a Canaanite priest according to Josephus and just according to his name and the name of the God that he was calling upon, there's pure evidence to suggest he was a Canaanite. We looked at one of the institutions, uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. We'll see bread and wine a lot when you go through the mythologies, trust me. A lot of people got triggered by this Olympic stuff saying that the Olympics are mocking Jesus and it's very good for business. Those Olympic things, they're very triggering because it's good for business. The Catholic get people going to the Catholic church to pray for their sins because people are mocking Jesus. Then the, the Christian, they get their little come up because people are mocking Jesus. It's very good for business. Trust me, there's certain things that trick, there's, there's triggers that happen on purpose because people are so predictable. You understand? But what if that whole narrative of, oh, it's mocking Jesus and the bread and the wine, what if it's not even to do with Jesus? What if it's Dionysus? Anyway, another story for another day. So we've looked at these Ali Yon references. Um, we've looked at 
the name Melchizedek. Why would Israel take this deity as their own? I thought Canaanites were the bad guys. You have to slaughter the whole lot of them with the Egyptians and the Germans and the Palestinians and all that kind of stuff. We looked at Jesus' name, Emmanuel. And we looked at the Canaanite religion was polytheistic. Not just the Canaanites, but religions in general were polytheistic because they were appreciating nature and their L amounts. Canaanite religion was polytheistic and in some cases monolatristic. That means they believed in the concept of many gods, but there was one crucial God. And you see the same theme in the Bible as well. You'll see it clear as day in our future presentations. All right, cool. We looked at this one too. Reference to Elion in Daniel. We looked at this guy talking about his prophet climate change or <laughs> prophet climate wise or whatever his name is. Uh, he wrote a book about, you know, invoking Elion and stuff like that. Um, next time we're going to look at from Al to Yah, how we got from Al to Yah, how do we go from Israel to Hezekiah and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's going to be interesting. All right, so look out for that one. Don't get triggered too much. And if you can tolerate it, come back. If you can't, it is what it is. But we are where we are, and we are where we are. A lot of religion, a lot of religion, no disrespect, man, it feeds on ignorance. It feeds on making you feel like you have something that is, um, you have more than somebody else, so that you feel, um, in, in a sense, prideful. They need to come to my faith because they don't know what they're talking about. They're heathens. They need to come to my thing because they don't know what they're talking about. They're pagans. Any kind of name to smear or discredit people because they don't believe in your religion or ideology and then you want to villainize them or make them into a scapegoat. We'll see all of these things will decode all of these religious manipulations and tools that are used to bring people into the fold so that the priest gets his nice car in his mansion. He gets his sacrificial offerings. He gets his 10% tax. And he also gets free land in a mansion. Anyway, we'll touch base soon. Big up, bless up, one.